Hello, can you see? Can you hear me now? Guys, am I am I audible now? Hi, Soumya. Yes. I can hear. Soumya can hear. Hi, Gorika. Yes, yes. Now it's clear. Hi, Ashita. Hello. Hi, Priyanki. Hi. Can you hear? Oh, it got cancelled. Perfect. 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 Yes. Can you all hear clearly, like without any breaking, without any lag? Is it proper? Yes. Oh my God, Tomia, don't do that. Good time. Yes, very good time. Obviously, sorry guys. Guys, just tell me, okay? Yes, now all clear, right? In case at any time, okay, proper. Done. Done, done, done. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Shaku, Fantas. Hi, Karthik. Thank you so much, Ashita. Thank you. Very good evening, and I'm super excited because we are doing photosynthesis in higher plants. I should got <laughs> it got cancelled. Good, no, good. It got cancelled. So now you can hear. Sachchi, Sachchi, बता ना मैम आपने ये DJ मैम की क्लास में कुछ जादू किया? हाँ, yes, yes. I only did my magic and then got cancelled. Good, no. Now you can be here. We can do. We can complete the entire chapter in this session. Hi, Navi. Hi, Krishna. Hi Nitya, sorry, sorry, sorry Nitya. Hi Manika, good evening. So yes, guys, welcome. I'm not going to spend all my energy in the beginning itself. We will complete the entire chapter of photosynthesis in higher plants. But but in order to start this, I want all of you to sit with your NCERT textbook. Can you all tell me? Open up your NCERT, okay, eleventh wala, and uh, keep your photosynthesis in higher plants ready. And then you tell me after you keep your NCERT book in front of you. Send a thumbs up or a green heart. Can you all do that? Yes. Hi, Selva. Once you open your textbook to this page, send me a green heart or a thumbs up in the chat box. How much duration have a class? It's five. Let's see. No. Anyways, one hour. I it will cross one hour, Krishna. Obviously. Yes. Two or six. Thank you. Thank you, Navi. Okay. Open up. Open up, guys. Open up your textbooks and then uh, we'll start. We'll start, okay. By the way, before that, I'll introduce myself. In case uh, any new students are here, my name is Ashima Joshi, and I'm your botany master teacher. I've been with Anto for more than two years, and uh, I just love botany. Okay, and today we're going to try and complete the entire chapter. Okay, yes. So page number is two or six. As always, Har Krishna. Yes, idhar bhi. Here also. Hi Kashish. Right, 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 right. And here we open. Awesome, awesome. So, in case you haven't uh, liked the video, right? Please do like it, okay, and share it with your friends. Again, like I said, I know a lot of you guys, people who are in eleventh, might also require the revisions. But people are who are in twelfth, and we are having our NEET twenty twenty three exam coming up soon. I know we need to revise our eleventh, okay? That is exactly why I brought up, and this chapter I thought is very very important. Also, high weightage plus very high concept. That is why, okay? Hi Surya. Right. So we'll start, huh? Photosynthesis in higher plants. We're going to start with the experiments. Almost, I think, at the third or fourth, I mean, third page of the chapter, we start with experiments where uh, basically they're telling you how difficult it was to, you know, discover photosynthesis or learn about it or understand that it is a very complex mechanism, right? So, <laughs> so then uh, what happens is uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you. Okay, this is very nice. Okay, because we have put up the entire list of scientists that you have to study about. Okay, everybody, in order, proper chronological order is there, along with what they found out. Okay, that is the inference of the experiment and what experiment it was. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning. But before that, there are some, there are some, uh, a couple of points talking about starch test. Okay, one thing I'll tell you, just, just basic things that you need to know. Is that starch test is done to find out? Okay, do you guys know what starch test is done for? Starch test is done to find out the presence of glucose. Okay, basically, what happens is when you add uh, iodine, okay, iodine to any green part of the plant, if there is presence of starch, the iodine will turn blue black color. Okay, so iodine will turn. Blue black, a blue black color when uh, when treated or when uh, reacted with starch. Okay, so this is your starch. 
starch test. This is there uh, in case. Okay, so this is one way we could understand that which part exactly of the plant is making food and all of that. Okay, so some basic thing. Okay, yes. Right. Hi, I'm Zain. Now that is that is one of the initial uh, what do you say um, experiments. Now after that we we'll go into the uh, scientists. Okay, starting with Joseph Priestley. So he was the one who discovered oxygen. How did he discover oxygen? Uh, he actually did an experiment. Okay, using a bell jar. Right. So he had a bell jar. He had a, uh, he had a candle lit. Okay, and he closed the candle or he covered the candle with a glass bell jar. What happened is it got extinguished. Obviously, now we know it is because of lack of oxygen, but then he didn't know, right? So it got extinguished, and later uh, he was like, "Okay, let's keep a mouse also inside." Okay, I I know, crazy, crazy thinking. He kept a mouse also inside, and he found out that when the mouse was there, the candle got extinguished faster. Then he kept a green plant. Okay, uh, it was a mint plant, and then he realized that it did not extinguish the candle also, and the mouse also lived. All right. So then he realized that. something the plant is doing something to purify the air the candle and the mouse is uh, releasing something harmful to the air okay to the atmosphere and plant is there to purify it right later he understood that it is oxygen right so when plants uh, are you know in the process of photosynthesis they release oxygen they utilize carbon dioxide they release oxygen candle requires combustion requires oxygen okay the same way animals also require oxygen for respiration Right, that we understood with Priestley's experiment. Then came Jan Ingenhaus. Okay, he concluded that only green parts of plant purify air. So what he did is he had aquatic plants like hydrilla and all. Okay, how did the scientists catch hold of mice? Now that is another extra. Uh, that 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 that's another uh, experiment only. Okay, but anyways, we don't have to worry about that. He found it. Okay, and he experimented with mice. That's the point. Anyways, so then Jan Ingenhaus, what he did is he started growing these aquatic plants like hydrilla or valsnaria or something like that, and he saw that from the green parts when he kept the aquatic plants in sunlight, okay, there were small bubbles forming out of the green parts. So then he realized, okay, there is something in the green parts, okay, and these small bubbles are oxygen bubbles, right? Yes, awesome. So that also he realized. Then came Julius von Sachs. He demonstrated that the first visible product of photosynthesis is starch. Okay. He also showed that chlorophyll is confined to chlorophyll. So you understand that okay, whatever this pigment is, okay, the color giving compound is in plastids, is in chloroplast. That he found. And the next thing he found is when photosynthesis is taking place, the product is glucose. Okay, which gets converted to starch for storage. Right. So that happens. That is what Julius von Sachs found out. Found out. Then we have P. W. Engelmann. Okay, Engelmann's experiment was very, very uh, different. Uh, it's a little complicated also. So what he did is he had a slide. Okay, the slides we use in our laboratories. So he had the slide. On top of the slide, he had cladophora. Okay, same as starch test. Yes. So on top of the slide, he had uh, he had our cladophora, which is our algae growing. Right. Now what? Usually, because now we know the answer, I'm telling you, cladophora is uh, is going to take light. Okay, it is going to utilize light energy, make food. Okay, do photosynthesis and also release oxygen. Right. So they will release oxygen. Now what he did is he used a prism. Okay, the prisms that you use for your physics experiment in your twelfth and eleventh practical. The same way he used a prism and he split the white light into seven colors. Yes, with your that's why the prisms are used for. Okay, so he used a prism. He uh, uh, what do you say? Split the colors into seven, and he found that, a co- I mean, in the range of violet to red. Okay, he found that in the blue region, blue region will definitely include violet, indigo, and blue. Okay, red region will include uh, yellow, orange, red. Okay, those three colors. Now in the center, which has green colors, the oxygen was very less. Now how do you know which area may there is more oxygen? Along with cladophora, okay, he also added some bacteria. He added aerobic bacteria. Now, now aerobic bacteria will live where there is oxygen, okay. So you have cladophora everywhere. Now the bacteria will choose where to go and live. Yes. So wherever the bacteria gets maximum oxygen, it will go and live there. So automatically, what we can understand is wherever photosynthesis is happening, 
there is more oxygen. Wherever there is more oxygen, there is more bacteria growing. Okay, high enough there. Right? That is how he understood that uh, there is different wavelengths of light has different effect on photosynthesis. He said it's not just white light. He could, uh, what do you say, he could, he could find out, he could, uh, what do you say, conclude that plants always prefer blue and red light. Okay, or the blue and red regions of light. Uh, and they don't like green light. That is why they reflect out green light. That's why we have green plants. Right? They don't like green, green color. They reflect it out. They utilize the blue and the red. Okay? No one loves it on Monday. So that was Engelman's experiment. Then came Van Neel. Okay? So uh, Van Neel demonstrated again. This is also a little complicated. Uh, so by now we have deduced that there is something called photosynthesis and Van Neel was trying to put out chemical reactions. Okay? He said bio is so boring without chemistry. Right? He said okay let's, let's make it more difficult. Let's make it more what is it? Uh, more factual. So he said okay let's try to put it in a reaction. And he understood that in, in aerobic organisms the plant utilizes carbon dioxide and water. Yes. Hi, Fami. Hi, Thiru. How do you find the presence of bacteria? He was growing bacteria. No, we all can grow bacteria and see where bacteria is growing using nutrient medium. Yes, Shaku. So he can. Yes. All that is possible. Okay. So what he did, Van Neel did, is that he understood that there are so many, uh, what do you say, reactions going on. He understood that we are giving the plants or plants are going to use water and carbon dioxide. Okay. But he wanted to understand when this redox reaction is happening, okay, when there is reduction of this carbon dioxide to form carbohydrates, who is that donor? Who is that electron donor? Okay, he wanted to find that out. He was confused. Where is that oxygen coming out? Okay, so we, we, we are telling that they involve oxygen. So he, wanted, he was confused. Is it coming from carbon dioxide or from H2? Okay, for that he did another experiment with sulfur bacteria. Okay, purple and green sulfur bacteria are there. They do photosynthesis. They are, they are photosynthetic autotrophic bacteria. But they don't use water. Okay, instead of H2O, okay, H2O you find in normal plants, instead of H2O, they use H2S. Hydrogen sulfide is used. Okay, now when they use hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide and they do photosynthesis, they don't evolve oxygen. They evolve sulfur. Okay. Then you they go. That is why. Because carbon dioxide is not changing. No. Carbon dioxide is same for both sulfur bacteria as well as plants. Yes. What is changing here? For plants we use H2O. And for sulfur bacteria we, we use H2S. So now if you give H2O to the plant, oxygen is released. If H2S is given to the bacteria, they release sulfur. They release sulfur. Yes, chemosynthetic bacteria. I mean, they photosynthetic only. Okay, green sulfur bacteria is photosynthetic. They do photosynthesis. It's just that they utilize hydrogen sulfide. Okay. Sure, sure, Krishna, no problem. Right. So he did that, and he found that okay, this whatever hydrogen donor, okay, this H two O or H two S, is the one that is going to give out electrons also. Okay, when we learn light reaction, I will tell you properly. That is Van Neel's, Cornelius Van Neel experiment. Right? Volume low. You want me to reduce the volume or you want me to increase the volume? Savannah? Okay. Anyways. Then, uh, so this with this, we finish off the experiments of photosynthesis. Blackman's law, we will utilize again in factors affecting photosynthesis. Okay, so Blackman's law is saying that when there are many factors, the lowest factor is going to determine key, how much of photosynthesis is happening. But again, this I will repeat in the end. Okay. So far, all the experiments were there. Find out. So, this much of information at least you guys should know. What was the experiment going on and what they inferred from the experiment. Okay. Now, let's, let's, let's get into more of photosynthesis. Where is photosynthesis happening? Basically, photosynthesis happens in the chloroplast. Okay. Because... We are all aware that we need the pigments. Okay. So plants exchange gases with the environment through stomata. Okay. We know that. We are aware of that. Okay. Now, so we 
get whatever source of carbon dioxide is there, we get from stomata. Okay. Now, leaf mesophyll cells. What are leaf mesophyll cells? The ground tissue of leaf. Yes. So in dicot plants, we have palisade and spongy parenchyma. In monocots, we have just mesophyll cells. Okay. So we have the green parts of the plant, the green cells of the leaf. They have abundant chloroplast. Okay. And we know chloroplast is. Okay. 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 Chloroplast is actually what? It is a plastid that stores pigments, colored pigments, right? Now, chloroplast contains gelatinous matrix called as a stroma. Okay, so the stroma of chloroplast is sorry, the matrix of chloroplast is stroma. Now, grana are stacks of thylakoid membranes. Now, it's not just watery, watery inside. They have a lot of membrane-like structures called as thylakoid. Now, these thylakoids are either stacked one on top of each other, like how you stack books. Okay, or they can also be separate. Okay, these thylakoid membranes, they can be in the form of grana also. Okay, if they are stacked, they are called as grana or they can also be stromal lamellae. Okay, so if they are stacked one above each other, we call it as grana. If they are separate, separate, we call it as stromal lamellae. Right? Separate thylakoid. Now, uh, yes, photosynthetic pigments are embedded in the thylakoid membrane. Now, if you if you look at chloroplast, okay, if you look at chloroplast, chloroplast is a double membrane structure. Okay, hi mother. Yes, I know, I know. Right? Chloroplast is a double membrane structure. It has an outer membrane, it has an inner membrane. Right? So, chloroplast has an outer membrane. Okay, it has an inner membrane. And between that, there is a uh, intermembrane space also. Okay, you can call that as periplastidal space. This gap between both of them. Okay, then uh, stroma is the entire liquid inside, and we have the thylakoid membranes also. So these stacks they call as grana or grana. Okay, this entire stack is called as a grana. The separate separate ones are called as stromal lamina. Okay, stromal lamellae. Separate ones. Ribosomes are there, thylakoids. No, now if you look at the thylakoid, okay, if you're going to draw a separate thylakoid, let's see how that looks like. Thylakoid is going to look like this. Okay, imagine this is a thylakoid membrane. This is a single membrane structure, okay? And inside we have a space called as the lumen. Yes, like how chloroplast has stroma, thylakoid has lumen inside. Now, it's on the thylakoid membrane, we have the uh, proteins for light reaction. Okay, hi Aditya. Ah, you want me to shout all the more, Savana? Try increasing volume at your end now. Try increasing volume at, at your end because at my end it is the maximum. It is the maximum. Okay. Right. Hi, Rakeshwaran. Yes, ma'am. Please shout once loudly. Huh. You don't want me to take the session? I'm new to this class. It's okay, Rakesh. Hi, Ganga. Hi, Tiru. Volume okay. Thank you, Surya. Why? Already so much of pollution from here. Why, why do you need 150 decibel now? Proving that you were listening to me yesterday in the session, huh? Anyways. Okay. This is the back. I'm good, Gaga. Right. You guys also increase your uh, volume to the maximum. To the maximum here also. Why it's not going, going beyond the point? Okay. Yes, Nithya, yeah, exactly. Right, so where are we? We were talking about lumen. Okay, thylakoid is there. All the proteins required for light reaction of photosynthesis are embedded on the thylakoid membrane. Okay, that also, for example, okay, let's get examples done. Okay, if we need PS1. 
Okay. Okay. PS two, PS one. All electron carrier, cytochrome B six F. Okay. Uh, plastocyanin, plastocyanin. All of these will be embedded on the membrane, and that is where light reaction happens. Okay. This uh, is stromal lamellae. Another name of lamellae. Yes, lamellae, stromal lamellae, the same thing. Okay. Lamellae are connecting between one grana. To the other grana, this is our lamellae. Okay, we can also call it a stromal lamellae. Why? Because they don't have any other thylakoids or above or below them. They are free. They are just facing the stroma directly. That's why we also call them a stromal lamellae. You can call them normal lamellae also. It's fine. Okay, Kashish. Hi, Mansi. All right. So this is the site of photosynthesis, guys. You need to know the structure of chloroplast. Every bit. Okay, now, 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 stages of photosynthesis. This? this is just, this is just an idea. Okay, but we will, uh, we will learn in detail. So it occurs in two stages. We have light reaction. Okay, also called as non-cyclic photophosphorylation and all that process. So light reaction will happen. We produce ATP, NADPH as a result of light reaction. Okay, then oxygen is released, released as a byproduct or as a waste product. Okay, then Elect okay, water is utilized, light is utilized. We use a lot of chlorophyll pigments also. Okay, chlorophyll pigments are also used. Now, now what happens? Okay, so the ATP and NADPH. Why do we need this light reaction? Light reaction is required only to produce ATP and NADPH. Okay, now this ATP and NADPH will be utilized in the carbon reactions or the Dark reactions, okay, also called as a biochemical phase. Okay, also called as a biochemical phase. So here, this ATP and NADPH will be utilized and they will make sugar. Carbon dioxide is utilized also. Right? So this is this is just an idea of what what we will learn today. Hi, Yuvanshu. Of course, Mansi. What is it? I don't have. Amnesia. Okay, I don't have any short-term memory loss. Yes, Mansi. Okay, photosynthesis being a redox process. So light energy is captured by chlorophyll molecules to boost the energy of electrons. Okay, so basically light energy which is captured is converted into chemical energy. We all know that. This chemical energy after it is I mean after it is converted, they have to store it. Okay, hi MBBS dreamer. Okay, so they store it in the chemical bonds of sugars, either in the form of starch. Okay, Pre uh, preferably in the form of starch only. This is how they store. Okay, blue is not written. I mean, short. Fine. So we know this also. Hmm. Organization. Okay. Now when we are talking about chlorophyll being the pigment, accepting light or converting light energy into chemical energy, we need to know what is actually there. We need to know what. When change karo ma'am. Achha, ha, yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, color, 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 got it. Okay, we need to know what exactly we are talking about in the photosystem. So let's see, photosystem is actually a group that contains chlorophyll also. And along with chlorophyll, it contains what? It contains the accessory pigments as well. Okay, so hundreds of accessory pigment molecules. Are that, what are the accessory pigment molecules? Uh, chlorophyll B. Please try 
I think it's good for the others, so I'm a little confused. Can you predict the date? Need 2024. Why, Madan? You don't want to live in peace? You don't want to live peacefully? Your Josh is low now. My Josh is not low. What is this? My Josh is never low. Okay, let me check, let me check, let me check, let me check. Fine, fine. Let's check, let's check. I've, I've told them. May 7th is this year. So, uh, Martin asked me for 2024, Nitya. That's why I said, no, I can't predict that long and all. I'm not a fortune teller anyways. Should I keep the microphone? It's closed only. I can't keep it closer. Because the voice is there. Okay, let's check, okay? Anyway, we'll continue. I'll, I'll get it fixed. Don't worry. Don't worry. So, we were talking about what? We were talking about the pigments, okay? All the pigments that are present. Hi, Vinod. Okay. So, chlorophyll A is a major pigment. It's called also called as a reaction center, okay? So, they gather photons and feed the capture light to the reaction center. Reaction center is our chlorophyll A. Okay, so chlorophyll A, like I said, is a main guy. He, uh, what these accessory pigments will do is they will absorb the light. Okay, so they, they're actually in a bunch. We also call them as uh, the antenna complex. Okay, we can call them as the antenna. Okay, we can also call them as, uh, as uh, light harvesting complex. Okay, when you have a lot of antenna molecules, we can also combine and call them as the light harvesting complex or LHCs. Okay. Now am I audible? Loud enough? Because I can't shout more than this. Reach an hour, yeah, I hope so. Okay, 
one. See us? Anyways, so it gets uh, excited. Now, the journey of electron, okay, from this excited state, from the starting of photosystem to the end, okay, that journey is your non-cyclic photophosphorylation, which we will learn, okay, in case that you don't know. Right, so stages of photosynthesis, we have light reaction, we have dark reaction. That re uh, light reaction, we know it happens in the thylakoid membranes, okay, I just showed you how it looks like. Water is split, okay, water is split uh, uh, with the help of oxygen evolving complex, okay, who helps with that? Oxygen evolving complex, okay, so we have an entire uh, set up where the oxygen is, I mean sorry, water is split, oxygen is released, electrons are given, yeah, uh, okay, oxygen has byproduct, ATP and NADPH is produced using light energy, it provides reducing power for the next process which is our dark reaction, dark reaction also called as the biochemical phase occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast, okay, so after the thylakoid membrane, whatever ATP, NADPH is there, that is given to the stroma and the rest of the reaction happens the happens in the stroma. Okay, now, Calvin cycle is a cyclic series, so entirely we usually call this Calvin cycle, okay, or CC cycle, but we have different variations, we will learn about that, right. It is often called as a dark reaction because it is not directly dependent on light, okay, it is not directly dependent on, right, it gets the products of light. It is based on the ATP and NADPH, which is a product of light. Now, we have two connected photosystems. I told you what photosystem is, okay? The entire collection of pigments together is our photosystem, having our light harvesting complexes and a lot of proteins and everything together. So, we have two, which is P700 and P680, okay? Photosystem 1 is P700. Why is it called as P700? Because the maximum wavelength of light it can absorb is 700 nanometer. Okay, whereas 680, the maximum they can take is 680 nanometer, right? Now, they can generate an oxidation, uh, oxidation potential high enough to oxidize water, okay? The two photosystems carry out a non-cyclic transfer of electrons. That means, once the electron starts at a point, it just gets reduced, okay? It is used up. We don't get the electron back. That's why it is called as non-cyclic photophosphorylation, okay? Here we have non-cyclic photophosphorylation. We have two photosystems, okay, and involves the reduction of NADP+. Uh, these are electrons enter into electron transport chain, okay. Please underline these very important words. I will show you how the movement happens, okay. Photoactivation of photosystem results in the release of electrons, okay, which reduce NADP+, and forms NADPH, right. The photolysis of water releases electrons, replacing those lost by the photosystem. Okay, I guess I, this is the structure, okay. I guess I will start drawing. Okay, you guys, if you want, you can draw along with me. I just follow.
Hey guys, can you hear me now? Is it clear now? Hello? Aditya? Somebody? Okay, okay. Got it. Thank you. Right, so this is like the base. Okay, we have the thylakoid membrane. Right, we have the thylakoid membrane. We have our proteins also arranged properly. Okay, so now what happens is uh, when water molecule is split or, okay, let's forget it. When there is uh, light, okay, so when there is light, okay, it induces all the light is captured by the pigments. Okay, there is excitation of an electron, right? So the electron gets excited. Okay, so we have the electron which is excited. This electron is going to be excited by our uh, plastoquinone is there. I think before that we put in uh, our uh, pheopyton also. Hmm? That's what I forgot. Okay. So we have our pheopyton molecule and then we have our plastoquinone. PQ is plastoquinone. This guy here is pheophyton. Pheophyton is just a chlorophyll molecule, but it does not, what do you say, this, this, this does not have the magnesium in it, so it is colorless. Colorless for, uh, chlorophyll is our pheophyton molecule. Right? Yes, see who this. Now this electron is going to go from the PS2, okay, it starts with PS2, 68 nanometer, it gets excited, it is accepted by our pheophyton, okay. Now from pheophyton, so every time uh, it moves through the electron carrier, the energy of electron is going to reduce, right. Now from pheophyton it moves into, uh, uh, sorry, uh, plastoquinin, okay, quinone, and then from plastoquinone it moves on to cytochrome B6 cell. Okay, so cytochrome B6 cell is there. The electron then moves on to plastocyanin. Okay, and imagine the electron sitting there. Yes, yes, mother. We'll, we'll talk about chemiosmotic synthesis. I mean, chemiosmotic synthesis. But this movement happens, okay, initially we have the electron moving all through this place. It comes here. Now, at the same time that PS2 is excited, we have PS1 also being excited. Okay? Once PS1 is excited, the electron from PS1, okay, goes into a higher energy orbital, okay, and then it is accepted by pyridoxin. Okay? So, let's have our pyridoxin here. So, imagine pyridoxin is here. Okay? So, this electron will take, I mean, will go into pyridoxin and then we have something called as the F. NR. Okay, what is FNR? Pyridoxin NADP reductase. Okay, so F pyridoxin NADP reductase. This FNR, this enzyme is going to convert the NADP into NADPH and for that the electron is utilized. Okay, so we have electron taken up by FD, it goes into FNR, okay, and this is going to get our NADP, converted into NADP H2, okay. This is our first product. Yes, NADPH is our first product. It is required for the dark reaction. We will utilize it. Don't worry. Now, here we have a lot of incomplete processes. We said in the beginning of electron, okay, it reaches till plastocyanin. And from here it is exi getting excited. Now, once PS1 gives out its first electron, now here there is a gap. Okay, it's given one electron. Now it requires more electrons. Okay, now this electron will be given there. From plastocyanin, the electron will actually be given to PS1 for replenishment because PS1 has lost it. Okay, it's got, it lost the electron. So now, now, now this guy requires the electron. So it is given by plastocyanin. Right? So this happens. Now, if PS1 requires the electron from somebody,
somebody else. PS2 also requires, no? Because right from the beginning, PS2 is only giving the electron. Now somebody has to give electron to PS2. That is where we have our water, splitting of water, called as photolysis. Very good. Okay. Photolysis of water, splitting of water happens. So we have H2O molecule. Inside the entire chloroplast. Right? So lumen is there. 
So the H plus moves from the lumen to the stroma through the ATP synthase enzyme. Right? Hi Shivani. Okay. These are better pictures of course. So we have the excited reaction center, plastoquinone, uh, cytochrome B6F complex, plastocyanin. Okay, the full forms are in the other uh, slides. You can check it out later. Photosystem 1, again it gets excited. So you see, when they're getting excited, if we put them according to the level of energy they have, it forms something like an N shape. Okay? So I would put it as N shape, but then they call it as a Z scheme. Okay? They call it as Z scheme because it looks like Z apparently to them. Okay? But yes, so there's a lot of requirements here. They require two photosystems here. They require this uh, reductase enzyme. Okay, peridoxin NADP reductase enzyme. There's a lot of requirements. They require water also. Okay, here there's splitting of water or photolysis of water. Right? Anything should move from higher to lower concentration. Yes, yes, Shaku. So what happens is when this, uh, when the plastoquinone is there, okay, bringing in more and more protons inside, lumen has a higher concentration of protons. That is creating a proton gradient. Yes, Shaku. So, because of plastoquinone, the lumen has more H+. So, from more H+, to from uh, to lower concentration. Lower concentration there is in the stroma. So, from lumen to stroma. And when that movement happens, there is ATP produced. That's called as chemiosmotic hypothesis. Okay, so you can see here. H plus will move into the stroma and ATP is produced. This is called as the chemiosmotic hypothesis. Okay, it's called as chemiosmotic hypothesis. Yes. So there is a membrane, no? You understand? Hi Pranal. Okay. There is a membrane, right? So when there is a membrane, initially stroma, so from stroma when it is coming into the lumen, they are not talking about concentration there because this is done by the plastoquinone. Okay. So plastoquinone is like every time electron is moving, it will bring H+. That time it does not care about the concentration. Okay. It will bring. But when there is too much of H plus in the lumen, that is when they are like, okay, there is too much of concentration. Okay, then they will send it back out. Yes, it is going like a cycle only there. Okay, except electron, baki, everything else is going in a cycle. Right? Yes, Pranal. Hello. Long time. Now. Let's talk about cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay, now this process is called as photophosphorylation. Why? Uh, okay, let's let's break it down first. Huh? Phosphorylation is basically addition of phosphate. Okay, what is phosphorylation? Again, you can't read. read no? Move back. My bad. Phosphorylation is addition of phosphate group. Yes, we are adding phosphate. Do you remember the reaction? ADP plus phosphate. Okay, when you merge them, you form ATP. Okay, adenosine diphosphate. In addition to adenosine diphosphate, if you add one more inorganic phosphate, you make it adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Okay? Sure, awesome, awesome, but mother, that will be great. Yes, yes, I know, Pranav. Now, imagine photophosphorylation. Light. When this phosphorylation reaction happens, because of light, we call this process as photophosphorylation. Okay, we call it as photophosphorylation. Now, we have non-cyclic and cyclic. Non-cyclic is over. In cyclic, the difference is, okay, let's talk about sulfur bacteria and stroma lamellae. Okay, stroma lamellae we don't know. Grana is when they are stacked one above the other. Stroma is when they are separate. Okay. Now, here we have only P700. Now, is that fair? It's not fair. Okay. In in, in non-cyclic photophosphorylation, we had two. We had P6, uh, 
a P680 and we have P700. Here, they, do, they don't have P680. They have only P700. Okay, that is our photosystem 1 in there. Now, how do we do photosynthesis with photosystem 1? We see. They generate ATP via electron transport. Okay, so ATP can be generated, but NADPH is not generated. Right? Anoxygenic photosynthesis, excited electron pass to electron transport chain. It generates a proton gradient. So, proton gradient is created. But there are a lot of things which are lacking. Okay, which are being lacked. Uh, I don't know if this is in the next slide or... Okay. Oh, here it will be there. Okay, cyclic photophosphorylation. Only photosystem 1 is used. Okay, P700 is the one which is used here. Electrons travel in a cyclic manner. They revert back to photosystem 1. ATP molecules are produced. Water is not required. Okay, oxygen is not evolved. NADP is not synthesis because there is no FNR. You know what FNR is, right? So, peridoxin NADP reductase is not present. Without FNR, we cannot make NADPH. Water is not required. Now, without water, without uh, oxygen evolving complex, oxygen is also not made. Right? It's predominant only in bacteria. Yes, okay. If no, cyclic and non-cyclic takes place simultaneously, it can happen or no problem. It's only benefit, right? So, in addition to the ATP, NADPH in non-cyclic, there will be a little more air to be produced, that's all. It doesn't do any harm, Zoya. But in certain organisms, only cyclic will take place. That means no NADPH at all. Okay? Let's look at cyclic. It's a simpler diagram. Okay? It's not as big as the previous one. It's a very simple diagram. So, I will draw. PS1 is there. Okay? Photosystem 1. Photosystem which has the 700 nanometer. Okay? So here they will get the light. Okay, it is illuminated. The electron will be passed on. Okay, the electron gets excited. It will be passed on to peridoxin. Okay, so yes, we do have our peridoxin here. But along with peridoxin, the others that we have is we have plastoquinone, we have cytochrome B6F, and we also have plastocyanin. Okay, these three are all there. Now the electron is going to move from peridoxin. Okay, there is no FNR, right? So this electron is going to come all the way back. And they will enter into, it will be accepted by our plastoquinone. Now we know the, what we know, we all know what happens in plastoquinone, right? There is transport of photons and protons also. So this will go into our cytochrome B6F. From cytochrome B6F, it goes back into plastocyanin. From here, it goes back. You see, this is a cycle. This is a proper cycle. The electron which is released by or released from the Photosystem 1 is going to come back here only. This is like a proper cycle. Okay, it's cyclic for a reason. It's coming back. Right? But here the main, the main point that you should know about is the transfer of protons. Okay, protons which are present in the stroma will definitely be transferred. Okay, so because this plastoquinone is still working, it will bring in more protons into the lumen. Okay, and we will still have our ATP synthase. Okay, we still have our ATP synthase enzyme. So these H plus will be taken back into the stroma. But at the same time, what happens? ATP is made. So, here we have ADP plus phosphate. Okay? Getting converted into ATP. Yes, we don't produce NADPH. We have only ATP produced. 
great. Okay. So if there's no NADPH, we, they, they can manage with ATP, right? This is your cyclic photophosphorylation, right? Chemo, chemiosmotic hypothesis takes place. ATP production is there. Photophosphorylation is happening. Okay. It's just that there is there are no other factor. I mean, other people here. Okay. We don't have oxygen evolving complex. We don't have photosystem two. We do not have FNR here. We, there is no splitting of water. There is no NADPH produced. There is no oxygen release. Okay, this is our cyclic photophosphorylation. All right, so you guys have the difference here. I don't have to explain all of that again. Now we'll move on to dark reaction. Okay, Karthik, you can follow me in my public account. Yeah, so that is it. You don't have to send request on Ashima Joshi underscore B. What is chemi osmosis? What is osmosis, Shaku? Osmosis means movement of usually water it is, okay? Movement of substance from its higher concentration to lower concentration across a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. Now, when there is movement of protons, protons considered as uh, a chemical, right? Okay, or uh, proton is basically a charged particle, right? So, chemi-osmosis is without water, we are only transferring the proton. So, when there is proton ka osmosis, it's moving from its higher to lower concentration, we call it as chemiosmotic hypothesis. Okay? Hi, Harish Priya. Uh, Chinkal. Okay, your, your uh, spelling is a little, I don't know. I hope your name is Harish Priya. Anyways, now we'll move on to dark reaction. We have made ATP and NADPH. Now we'll utilize the ATP and NADPH. Okay? Basically, it happens in three steps. Carboxylation, reduction and regeneration. But the question is, where is this happening? It happens in the stroma. Okay? Now, why does it happen in the stroma? Because if you see, the products, okay, whatever ATP or even NADPH, these are all released to the stroma, right? Yes, they are all produced and released into the stroma. So, the rest of the reaction has to happen in the stroma only. Right? So, instead of H2O, there is protons. Yes, because H2O is being split here. Right? H2 will be there, but it's just that it's getting split. So, this reaction, dark reaction happens in the stroma or the chloroplast. Okay? Carboxylation is there. That is carbon fixation. We also call it as carbon fixation. Then we have reduction reaction and then we have regeneration reaction. Right? So, fixation of carbon dioxide into a stable organic intermediate in which carbon dioxide is utilized. Okay? Uh, so, we have something called as RUBP. RUBP is a carbon dioxide acceptor molecule. Okay? The one who accepts carbon dioxide. So, we have carbon dioxide as a gaseous molecule. There should be somebody to accept it. So, we have RUBP, which is a 5-carbon compound. Okay? The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme RUBP carboxylase oxygenase or also called as Rubik's coenzyme, which is the most abundant enzyme in plant, in the earth, I mean on the earth, right? Which results in the formation of two molecules of 3 PGA. Since the enzyme also has oxygenation activity, it's called as RUBP carboxylase oxygenase or Rubik's co. Okay? So here, hmm, you want me to draw mine? Let's see if I can add one more slide to it and I'll draw my version of Okay, let's start with C3 cycle. C3 cycle or dark reaction or you can also call it as Calvin, Calvin cycle okay you can call it in many ways but yes handmade diagram you must be tired of seeing it every single time okay anyway We'll start with 
we have carbon dioxide molecule okay carbon dioxide molecule which is taken from the stomata i mean through the stomata okay from the atmosphere we have our carbon dioxide acceptive molecule which is rubp okay rubp is ribose 15 bisphosphate so carbon dioxide has one carbon rubp has five carbon okay so we should be forming a six carbon compound immediately so that's how the case okay here what happens is there is this merging and again the splitting so instead of forming one six carbon compound okay because five plus one is six here instead of that they are going to form something called as two two molecules of three phosphoglyceric acid okay two molecules of three pga is also six only right two into three carbon So this is the first stable product of this reaction, and because they are three carbon compounds, this phosphoglyceric acid. Okay. Sorry, Bala, I I really don't know physics. Right. So because this is phosphoglyceric acid and this is a three carbon compound, we call it as C three cycle. Okay, that's why the name is C three cycle. Right. Hi, Ra. Physics. Shreya sir is taking no physics, Bala. Okay. Anyways, so we have this first reaction, and we have an enzyme also taking care of it. The enzyme is called Rubisco enzyme. Okay. The enzyme is Rubisco enzyme. All right. So this three PGA is there. Now there is actually a series of reaction that takes place here. Uh, I will add phosphorylation and then reduction. Okay. But After all this reduction, at the end they will form glucose. Okay, after the entire process of reduction reaction, we will form glucose. That is a six carbon compound. Okay, math means you said the same about math. I really can't take physics and math. I can only take botany. Okay, that's why we have special teacher for physics and math. Come on, guys. Okay, so here we are going to use ATP and NADPH for every cycle. We are going to use um, yes, we are going to use one ATP and one NADPH here. Okay, no two ATP and two NADPH here. Two ATP. Okay, and here we have two. Utilized. Okay, they be utilized. But from where are we getting these? We are getting this from the light reaction. Okay. Right. Anyways, we are utilizing them. We are utilizing them. Okay. We got it with a lot of difficulty. We got it from our light reaction, so we have to use them. Okay. And that's how we make glucose. Uh, but that means it should be done though. We only have to make glucose. But the problem is we have to okay NADPH. Okay, you can get the full form online, Shahid. Okay, it's actually okay. Anyways, <laughs> right. So we we continue. This glucose molecule it is made I agree, but we have to regenerate this RBP molecule. Okay, we can't utilize this. This is just an acceptor molecule. This is just like a carrier molecule. Okay, we cannot utilize RBP. We have to give it back. It's just like borrowing. Okay, so this glucose say from this process, we also have to focus on giving RBP back. Okay, this process is called regeneration. Here also they use a molecule of ATP every single time. We have three parts to this process. Okay, we have carboxylation. We have reduction, and we have regeneration. We have 
three steps, okay? But here, if you look at this process, now the numbers are not matching. Okay, yes, this is cyclic Surya, this is cyclic, but the numbers are not matching because here we have 6 carbon, okay, here also we have 6 carbon, we are making 6 carbon, then if we are utilizing 6 carbon here, who is going to give back this 5 carbon compound, right? So, this one cycle cannot make glucose, yes, one cycle cannot, is not sufficient to make glucose, we need this to happen 6 times. For, for us to prepare or for the plant to make one molecule of glucose, it has to undergo this carboxylation and reduction at least six times. Okay? So, here we are going to multiply everything by six and then we will get the correct calculation. So, here we require six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of RUBP. Okay? That means here we have six into two molecules of GMA, okay, that is around 12 molecules. From those 12 molecules, so here also ADP also you will need 6 into 2. Here also you NADPH also you need 6 into 2. Okay, and you need one molecule of glucose. To make one molecule of glucose, we need 6. So what about the rest? Okay, the rest is going to go back into making the RUB. Okay, 6 carbon dioxide molecule is required to make one molecule of glucose. Okay, so if you look at the reaction, 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 RUBP, okay, along with 6, 6, nine, six here also 6, right, okay, so 6 plus 6, 12 ATP, okay, plus 6 NADP. All of this is required together to make one molecule of glucose. RUBP has to be given back. Okay, 6 RUBP has to be given back. Okay, so for this to happen, we require 6 turns of the cycle. Okay, this entire process has to happen 6 times. That is how you make glucose molecules. So, where does this take place? It takes place in the stoma. Okay? It's, it's available in all the plants, Aditya. You can get it from there. Bye, Shivani. Alright. Now, this is fine. Everything is going well. We are making glucose. Okay? The problem is with Rubisco. Okay? The problem comes because we are utilizing an enzyme called as Rubisco, which is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase enzyme. Okay? So, here we have a carboxylase oxygenase enzyme. That means, this guy has double role. Right? It has double role. It, ha it does two things at a time. It can also fix carbon dioxide. At the same time, it can fix oxygen. Okay? So, that is when we have phos photorespiration or C2 fiber. Right? Uh, it was discovered by Decker and Tio. I, I don't think you need to know that. But anyways, what happens is oxygen, okay, and release of carbon dioxide in C3 photosynthetic cell is called as photorespiration. Basically what happens is, uh, instead of carbon dioxide being fixed into RUBP, oxygen gets fixed. Okay? Yeah, this is a huge cycle. We require at least three uh, what do you say? Uh, we require at least three organelles for it. We need chloroplast, we need peroxisome, and we need mitochondria. Okay? But I guess I will give you an easier cycle again for this. Link is there in the description box. Alright. 
Okay, so basically what happens is in C3 cycle, okay, under normal condition, we have C3 pathway, C3 cycle. The reaction goes like this. We have carbon dioxide, okay, we have RUEP, okay, one carbon, this is five carbon. We have the enzyme, we are making two molecules of three phosphoglutaric acid. Right? Two into three phosphoglutaric acid, that means two into three carbon. This is like the first step, no? Now, when it comes to photorespiration, when it comes to three, C2 cycle, Instead of carbon dioxide, oxygen is going to be fixed. Okay? Because the Rubisco molecule, the Rubisco enzyme can fix. Yes, 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 Shri Nath, I already sent it. Check. Okay, oxygen is going to be fixed with RUBP. Okay? Five carbon. There's no carbon here because it's oxygen, right? So this five carbon. And instead of making two molecules of PGA, because now we can't. We can make one molecule of 3-PGA, okay, 3-phosphoglyceric acid is there, okay, plus you can make one molecule of phosphoglycolic acid. Okay, this guy is new. Who is this phosphoglycolic acid? It's a two-carbon compound. Okay, phosphoglycolic acid or phosphoglycolate is a two carbon compound because this is a three carbon compound. Now you see the equation is balanced because we had five carbon, okay, in with, with five carbon we cannot split it into three carbon compounds, no. So we make one three carbon compound, we make one two carbon compound. Now it's because of this two carbon compound that we call it as C2 cycle. Okay, here what happens? Photorespiration takes place. They're utilizing oxygen, okay, and they're producing two compounds out of which only this we can use for photosynthesis. We can only use PGA. We can't use this phosphoglycolic acid. It's a waste of process. Okay. Oh my God, Karthik. Okay. Anyways, it took me time to read that message. Okay. Right. So. Usually in C3 cycle, this is what happens. Now, because carbon dioxide is not fixed, instead of carbon dioxide, oxygen is fixed, okay? It goes into a problem. Now, we don't want photorespiration to happen, okay? It is a wasteful process. Okay? Photorespiration is a wasteful process because it utilizes energy, okay? It takes up all the energy. It is not making any energy. It is not making glucose. Nothing useful it is doing. Okay, it's a completely wasteful process. So in that case, we should find some mechanism to stop photorespiration. Okay, because this Rubisco is making an issue. Okay, so Rubisco has to be tamed. Okay, it's because of Rubisco. Right, the enzyme is tamed, but Rubisco actually selects. So if in case Rubisco finds that there is more oxygen and less carbon dioxide, it will go and fix oxygen. Now in our atmosphere, okay, in our atmosphere, we are going to have more oxygen. We are having about 21% oxygen and only 0.03% carbon dioxide. So obviously Rubisco is like, huh, I'm going to go with oxygen only. And QFSR. Okay, it's not even going to see, it's not even going to look at the carbon dioxide molecule. Right? It'll be like, I found oxygen, so I'm going to fix oxygen only. And fixing oxygen is such a wasteful process. Now, what will the plants do? Because plants require energy. Plants require food. Plants have to make food. Now, if Rubisco is not going to behave well, yes, if Rubisco is not going to behave well and fix carbon dioxide, we have to put Rubisco into jail. Okay? Or waste. Right. So, the only way we can put Rubisco into jail is by creating, is making the plants evolve. 
the plants realize that with C3 cycle and photorespiration happening, we can never be efficient. Okay, we can never be efficient. So, the plants evolved, okay, in such conditions, in dry tropical regions and everything, they have something called as a C4 pathway. It is an evolved pathway. Okay, it's an evolved pathway. It's a better pathway, right? So, we have certain plants which have C4 cycle in them, right? They have C4 oxalic acid as the first carbon acidification product. They use the C3 cycle. Yes, C3 cycle takes place, but it is isolated. Okay, which jail? Are you which jail? I tell you which jail. C4 plants are special. They have special type of leaf anatomy. They tolerate higher temperatures. They don't mind about temperature also because they have jail. Okay, so they will protect everybody inside the jail. Because even high temperature, they're like, it's okay. It won't reach the jail. Right? No, 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 no. Camp cycle is not there in the entire they, they will not ask you camp cycle, Sanjay. Don't worry. Right? They show response to high light intensities. They lack photorespiration. Okay? And have greater productivity of biomass. That means more efficiency. Okay? So they have more efficiency because they do not have, C4 plants will never have photorespiration. They will never have C2 cycle. Okay, they will never have C2 cycle. I fixed it, Mahesh, Monica. I fixed it. Volume was low, but I fixed it. Anyways, no Sanjay, I told you no, volume is too, okay, it's fine, camp cycle is not there in the NCRT, camp cycle is not there in the NCRT, okay, okay, I don't know why, alright, I'll try to speak a little more louder, okay? That'll be too old. If you check the last five years questions, it will not be there. Okay? Alright. So now let's learn about Kranz anatomy. Like I said, in C4 plants, they have a special... Uh, what is it? Anatomy only. They have evolved in such a way that they have special anatomy. They have special cells. That means basically they don't have any new cells. They are utilizing the old cells they have. So, what happens usually or when we talk about C3 plants, photosynthesis happens in the mesophyll cells. Okay. It will happen in the mesophyll cells. Now, here in addition to mesophyll cells, they are like, okay, let's do one thing. Let's take up bundle sheet cells also. Okay, let's see how we can use bundle sheet cells. Because bundle sheet cells are stronger cells, okay, that give strength to the vascular bundles. They are actually around the vascular bundles. If you look at bundle sheet cells, you will find them around vascular bundles, okay, usually. But they don't have chloroplast. They never had chloroplast. Now, because of photorespiration, because of C4 cycle, they have started producing chloroplast inside the bundle sheet cells. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay, man. Now, these bundle sheet cells, okay, they are specialized. Now, they have chloroplast and the, now they said, okay, we'll do one thing. I told you about putting this rubisco into jail, no? Okay. Let's put rubisco into the bundle sheet cells. Because the bundle sheet cells have very thick wall. Okay. It's called a scrans and I'll tell you why. Because of the design. You see, we have the vascular bundle and we have the Bundle sheet cells surround it. Okay, it looks like a wreath. It look up. It uh, looks like a flower wreath arrangement. That is why. Okay, that is why we call this Kranz anatomy. Right? It's called. It it means wreath. Kranz means wreath, and it's a reflection of arrangement of cells. So here the bundle sheet cells are there. Several layers are there. They are characterized by. Okay. So what do you find the bundle sheet cells special character? One is they have a large number of chloroplasts which was not there in jail se nikal diya rubisco ko no 
No, we're going to put the Rubik's Cube into J. Okay. Now, thick wall impervious to gaseous exchange. That means no oxygen allowed. These bundle sheet cells will not allow oxygen to enter the cell or carbon dioxide to exit the cell. Okay. See, the problem was what? Oxygen is there. Rubisco looks at oxygen and it goes with oxygen. Okay. Now, make sure that Rubisco does not meet oxygen. No. Make sure that Rubisco is given only carbon dioxide. When Rubisco sees only carbon dioxide, it will fix carbon dioxide. If it sees oxygen, it goes with oxygen. Right. So, make a jail. Okay, create a jail where oxygen cannot go inside, right, but carbon dioxide can. That is all about our C4 cycle. Okay, let's see how it works. So we have C3 plant, C3 plant where all the process is happening in the mesophyll cells, but C4 plant where we have bundle sheet cells, right, we have bundle sheet cells. Now, it's also called as hatch and slack pathway because of the scientist, of course. We have two separate cycles taking place, okay, and two areas also. So, one half of the cycle takes place in the mesophyll cell, okay, the top cell is mesophyll cell. The second half of the cycle takes place in the bundle sheet cell, okay. Oh my god, Ram. Jail will be oxygen proof. Exactly. Okay. Jail will be oxygen proof. They will not allow oxygen inside. Now, let's look at the cycle. Okay. It's also called the hatching cycle pathway, the primary carbon dioxide acceptor. Okay. Here, the acceptor has also changed. We don't use Rubisco anymore. Okay. Because where is Rubisco? Rubisco is inside here. Okay. Rubisco has been put here. Let, let me show you where is Rubisco. Rubisco is inside here. Okay, this guy is in jail. Rubisco along with RUBP, everybody is here. Calvin cycle is happening here. Our C3 cycle takes place inside the bundle sheet cell. Okay? Oh my god, Karthik. Shreya will come. Okay, you tell it. Okay, so anyways, the enzyme responsible for this fixation is PEP carboxylase. So here, they have a different carbon dioxide acceptor. They have a different enzyme. They said, no, we can't do with Rubisco. Rubisco is, Rubisco is not useful now. It will always go with, it will always run away with oxygen. So, let's put Rubisco into jail. Let's bring somebody else, no. Okay, so here what happens is, they take carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is taken. It is fixed with the help of an enzyme called PEP carboxylase. Okay, okay, Aditya, good on that. So, PEP so PEP phosphoenol pyruvate is the acceptor molecule. Yes, phosphoenol pyruvate is the acceptor molecule. It's a three carbon compound. Right? It's a three carbon compound. So one carbon compound carbon dioxide, three carbon compound PEP. You fuse them together, you fix them together, you get a four carbon compound. Which is a four carbon compound? Oxaloacetic acid. Okay, so the first stable product here is a 4 carbon compound, oxaloacetic acid and that is why we call hatch and slack pathway as C4 cycle. Okay, it's called as C4 cycle because of oxaloacetic acid. Right, so here the step is we have carbon dioxide, 1 carbon, PEP which is the acceptor, it has 3 carbon you fuse it together, you make oxaloacetic acid which has 4 carbon molecules. Now what? Now this oxaloacetic acid will be converted into a very similar molecule called as malic acid. Which is also 4 carbon. Fine. Okay. It doesn't make much of a difference. This malic acid. Why is it converting into malic acid? Because malic acid is very transportable. They can move. Oxaloacetic acid is lazy. Oxaloacetic acid will not move. Malic acid will move. So, they convert it to malic acid. They are asking malic acid, okay, you know what? You go to the jail. Okay? You go to the jail, find Rubisco, you give carbon to Rubisco. You give carbon dioxide to Rubisco. That is the work of malic acid. Okay? It is 4 carbon. 
it moves to the bundle sheet cell. Once it reaches the bundle sheet cell, okay. Why malic acid? But malic acid is not lazy. Oxaloacetic acid is lazy. Malic acid is very active. Okay, oxaloacetic acid is lazy. So now malic acid goes inside, right? Here there is a decarboxylation reaction happening. Okay. So here this is called as decarboxylation reaction. I will write this over here. Okay. Decarboxylation. Decarboxylation meaning removal of carbon dioxide. Yes, Shrinath, I will complete it. Okay, I will complete it today. Right? We have reached C4 cycle. No, that's it. C4 cycle is over. Then we have only factors affecting photosynthesis. Entire chapter is over. Okay? I'm standing in front of you. I've moved. So, here we have decarboxylation reaction where malic acid has four carbons now. After decarboxylation, it will give out one carbon. Okay? In the form of carbon dioxide. So this malic acid becomes a three carbon compound which is called as pyruvate, pyruvic acid. Okay. Now what is the entire process? What we do just now? What did we do? We only converted and made compounds, okay, substances so that it will go and it will deliver carbon dioxide, okay, carbon dioxide to Calvin cycle. Making sure that Rubisco, Rubisco is in the jail. Rubisco is only going to make carbon dioxide. And every time Rubisco makes carbon dioxide, it is going to do C3 cycle only. Okay. So, we are facilitating the photosynthesis process. We are facilitating the dark reaction. Okay. Tomorrow, chapter, I am not taking class tomorrow. Next Friday. We will do respiration. No. The next difficult chapter is respiration in plants. We will do that. Okay. Kartik, Surya. Oh, Surya and Kartik. Okay. Nice. So decarboxylation, carbon dioxide is released. This carbon dioxide goes into the Calvin cycle. It makes glucose. Now what happens to the pyruvate, which is left behind after malic acid, releases the carbon dioxide, it becomes pyruvic acid. This pyruvic acid goes back into the mesophyll cell. Regeneration happens, converts it back into PEP, which is the acceptor molecule. Okay, you want me to write it in my way? Mesophyll cell and yep, two big cell. Okay, now what you have to understand is this is our bundle sheet cell. We have mesophyll cell, we have bundle sheet cell. So we're going to start. We're going to start with carbon dioxide. Okay, we'll start it like this. We have carbon dioxide, which is one carbon compound. Yes. Plus phosphoenol pyruvate. Phosphoenol pyruvate is our carbon acceptor molecule. Okay, which is a three carbon compound. Yes. We have an enzyme called as pepcase. We convert it into oxaloacetic acid, which is a four carbon compound. The enzyme utilized here is 
light reaction, we have dark reaction. If dark reaction doesn't work, we have to put Rubisco into J. So it's a, it's a long process, it's a huge process. So that means photosynthesis is dependent on many, 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 many things. Okay? No problem there. No problem. Right? First is light intensity. How much of light, how bright light do you, do you require for photosynthesis? Okay? Now, for photosynthesis to happen, you can give the plant very high bright light. Because at a point, you know, light intensity doesn't matter. How much ever light they get, they will utilize it. Okay? Increased light intensity means higher rate of photosynthesis. They will be more happier to do photosynthesis. Okay? They will be all the more happier to do the photosynthesis process. On the other hand, if it is low light intensity, if it's if you are giving very dim light, the plant will be like, what are you doing? Okay? Give me a little more light. So they require high intensity light. And you there. Okay? They do require high intensity light for having a proper rate of photosynthesis. Then, concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, we have, we have understood that carbon dioxide is very important for plants. Okay? Because Rubisco, Rubisco has to find carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis. So, there should be a good concentration. Again, usually carbon dioxide in the range of 300 to 400 ppm. That is 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 percentage in the atmosphere. That much of carbon dioxide is okay for the plants. That's like the highest, okay? Now, 4 ppm is like perfect for plants. Now, if you increase it more than that, then the plant will also get tired, okay? So, if it goes more than 500 ppm, the plant cannot survive, okay? It becomes too much for the plant, right? So, 300 to 400 ppm is like perfect concentration of carbon dioxide. So, if it is too less also, carbon, I mean, photosynthesis is less. If it is too high also, photosynthesis is less. Hi, Crazy Camera Studios. Okay, we are almost coming to the end, but photosynthesis, the entire chapter is almost done. Okay, you can check it later. Yes? Okay, next comes temperature. Everybody likes temperature and everybody requires a proper temperature to work with. Yes? You also. For studying, everybody has an optimum temperature. If it is too cold, you will feel like sleeping. Okay, you'll feel lazy, you won't feel like studying. If it is too hot, also you won't feel like. So you do need, no, you need a pleasant climate for you to study. Yes? The same place, the same way for plants also. There is an optimum temperature, something between 25 to 35 degrees Celsius, 25 to 40 degrees Celsius also is fine. That temperature the plants are very happy, they will do photosynthesis. Below that, if it goes below, uh, you know, uh, 10 degrees Celsius, 0, 0 degrees Celsius, and all, the plants will not be able to manage. Because you see, it depends a lot on enzymes. Okay. So, the enzymes will get deactivated. Right? Hi, Loheshwar. Okay, Aditya. You studied 0 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Good. That means you don't study only. Huh? I know. So yes, temperature, optimum temperature is very, very important. If it goes too much higher than the optimum temperature also, the, the proteins, the enzymes will get denatured. Okay, it will get denatured. Sure, Loheshwaran. Sure, 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 sure. Now, water. We all know, where is water utilized? Yes, can you tell me? We learned it today. Where is water utilized? In which reaction? For what is water utilized? Can you tell me? Sure, Lohi, sure, I will tell. Cyclic? No, for non-cyclic, Surya. Yes, good, 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 good. For, for non-cyclic photophosphorylation, photolysis of water is there. Okay, we need water to be split and the electrons to be used. Okay, bye, Lohi, sure. Right, so as water is an important factor, it Deficiency can lead to problem in the intake of carbon dioxide. What is very important. Now, if water is not there, okay, forget about photolysis of water. The plant itself will die. Okay, plant itself will die. So, water is important for the growth of the plant. More than photosynthesis, it is required for growth of the plant. Very good, Kalitinya. Thank you.
you crazy camera studios thank you right next we have pollution okay industrial pollutants and other particular uh, particulate matter may settle on the leaf surface they block the stomatal pores if stomata is blocked what happens there is no oxygen or carbon dioxide taken yes that is a problem so pollution also should not be there they should have proper air okay so these are the factors affecting photosynthesis here is where you will learn about blackman's law of limiting factor okay basically i'll tell you this is the last thing and we are done for the day right so blackman's law of limiting factors states that when you have multiple factors you see photosynthesis is a process where many factors are there okay when you have multiple factors what happens is if one factor is little less the entire rate of photosynthesis go go down yes so it's a team work in a team even if one person is not doing well the entire efficiency of the team can go down yes like how we have in the chat box it was going fine one person started sp spamming the entire session the entire people will start spamming now yeah like that so that's called as blackman's law of limiting factor that factor is called as the limiting factor okay so it can be temperature it can be carbon dioxide concentration whatever but if there's one factor which is very least or very low that can affect the entire rate of photosynthesis okay exactly right so we're done we're done with the entire chapter of photosynthesis we'll come up with i'll come up with questions next or next week we will do respiration in flowering i mean respiration in plants there also you have a lot of reactions to study okay so i'll plan something like this only one shot okay so yeah good to go now you can ask me if you have any doubts and do not forget to like and share the video okay and if oh my god okay thank you there's a quiz also for you you can attempt the quiz and let me know if the questions were okay or good okay let me know in the comments right ha ha we do teach human physiology zoology human physiology sindhu ma'am is taking kashish okay right so in case in case in case you have not liked the video please do and subscribe to the channel because we are coming out with many many more videos so next i am going to do respiration okay cool i'll do it so yeah next week next week chalo then see you guys next week next friday only same time probably 4 o'clock 6 o'clock something okay we'll do it all right guys bye bye